Good morning, everyone. Man, I love getting here on Sunday to see my Mercy family. How are you all doing today? It's good to be with you. Our dear pastor, Eugene, and family are on a much-needed, much-overdue vacay. Uh, So we love you, buddy. We miss you. But he called me in hot off the bench. I'm eager to go and dive into the Gospel of Mark with you. Uh, We are doing a sermon series, verse by verse, through the Gospel of Mark. And do do you have that friend or family member that just has, like, no filter at all? I mean, they get right to the point. They don't even bother softening the blow. That's Mark. That's the gospel of Mark. He gets right to the point. There's, there's no fluff, no delay, simple, brief, powerful. I mean, just check out the opening line. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Pow! He just, all of a sudden, This Jesus guy out of nowhere tells us that he's the son of God, tells us that he's the Christ, right? Which is the Messiah that's saying he's king. And then we're going to see some major movements happen in the first chapter of Mark in just a few verses. The first major movement that we're told of is that the king is coming. That's John the Baptist. You'll remember he's saying, someone's coming after me whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie, right? The king is coming. The next big movement that we'll see is that the king is anointed, right? That's Jesus' baptism. You remember the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove, God speaking, saying, you are my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. That's the anointing of the king. Then the next big movement, we saw it last week, is that the king is tested, right? The Holy Spirit leads him out into the wilderness to be tested by Satan, tempted by Satan, and he's found to be righteous. He's found to be worthy of the crown. Today, this week, we're going to see another big movement in Mark. This one, we could say, is that the king is on assault, On assault, like Jesus going on attack? Yeah, that's right. In this text, there's just two brief little verses. It's an entire movement in the story. It's a pivotal shift from our king's preparation to our king's mission, our king's campaign, our king's conquest. With no filter, no fluff, it's an exact moment of time that we see here, Jesus is going to make a proclamation that will leave his enemies in the physical world in complete shock and leave his enemies in the spiritual world in complete retreat forever. And this proclamation continues in that same power even to this day. But enough of my words. You want to see his? Here is our verse, a couple of verses for today. We're in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. They say, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Father, we are so incredibly grateful for your word. We're grateful for this truth. We're thankful for the good news of salvation that your Lord has accomplished. God, help us to see it today. Move over us in power today by the spirit that you have sent. And now, God, I would pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, let me tell you a story. There was a man, a Jewish man named Johann. He lived roughly 2,000 years ago, and his family was from North Africa. They were pretty well-to-do, and when Johann was still a boy, his father decided to move the family from North Africa right into the heart of the city of Jerusalem. Now, if you're curious, given the time frame and the location, if maybe Johann had the opportunity to meet Jesus, Well, your intuition would be spot on. He did meet Jesus. In fact, he became a disciple of Jesus, him and his mother. And he met the apostles too. And after Pentecost, when the church started to spread throughout the land of the empire, well, Johann was eager to get out on a missionary journey with those apostles, and they finally led him. Unfortunately, 
It was a total disaster. Yeah, Johann hadn't realized how tiring it would be, how difficult it would be, how extremely dangerous mission work is. And sadly, about halfway through, he abandoned the apostles and went home to Jerusalem to his family. It was a total disgrace, but thankfully, that's not the last chapter that we have for Johann. You see, he mustered up new courage and he won back the faith, the trust of the apostles. So much so that years later, they would actually request him to come to them. And eventually, Johann would go on a missionary journey of his own to North Africa. Yeah, he ended up in one of the crown jewels of the ancient world, the city of Alexandria. And almost the minute that he showed up on the scene, he began winning over lives to Christ. Now, the pagan leaders in the city were furious about this as the years went by and they watched this group of Christians grow who stood against everything that they believed in. It reached a boiling point in the year 68. On Easter Sunday, they formed a mob that rushed into the building that Johann and all of the Christians were in and they seized Johann, brought him outside, tied him up, and dragged him behind a horse down to the prison of the city. It was awful. They threw him in a cell. Johann was badly beaten up, still alive, and undeterred. And the pagans knew this. And in the morning, they seized Johann out of his cell, this time putting the rope around his neck, and dragged him by the neck behind that same horse, around and around the city until gruesomely there was really nothing left. It did not have the effect that the pagans had hoped. You see, because instead of being deterred by his death, the Christians were emboldened by his faith. And the church there exploded. So much so that... To this day, Johann will forever be remembered as the man who brought Christianity to Egypt. It's an amazing story. You might not be familiar with the story, but I know for certain you're familiar with the man. You might not know him by his Jewish name, but I'm sure you'll recognize his Greek name, Marcos, Mark, the evangelist. The same Mark who wrote the gospel of Mark, the text that we're looking at today. Wow, from coward to courageous, from heading home to mama to heading home to glory. What changed? I didn't know the man personally, but I do know what changed him. It's the one thing that can truly change anyone's heart, the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ changes your heart when you first believe. The gospel keeps changing your heart as you believe. And I'll share with you that this passage today hits close to home for me because it's a real burden on my heart that those who hear the true gospel become believers and those who have become believers truly know and truly grow in that gospel for the rest of their lives. I mean, it's near and dear to me that our mission here at Mercy is to see people saved and see saved people grow, just like Mark did. So it seems to me that the next logical concern for us needs to be, what exactly is this gospel of God? As Jesus called it here. Are we getting it right? Well, we better be. Because Paul warns us in Galatians 1, saying, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than the one that we've preached to you, let him be accursed, anathema. That's the highest level of curse that you can pronounce on someone. It's a big deal. There is only one gospel in all of scripture. And now it's left to us to make sure that we understand that one gospel correctly. So what gospel, what good news are we proclaiming to others and to ourselves? The very first word in Jesus' gospel message today in the Greek is fulfilled. It's like a big neon sign. Fulfilled. It means complete. 
to the full, lacking in nothing. So it seems only appropriate that we ask the question, how complete is our own gospel message? Is our gospel his gospel? We'll see here today in his gospel message, the good news that Jesus preached in our text is centered around two simple things, the kingdom's arrival and the kingdom's conditions. I'm hopeful we'll consider these I'm hopeful we can consider why these are such good news for us. Let's begin where Jesus himself began. Does our gospel proclaim that the kingdom has arrived? He says right off the bat, the time is fulfilled. What time? Well, what's he talking about? There is, ironically, not enough time for me to delve into all the aspects of the progression of the kingdom of God through scripture. Let me give you the most brief synopsis I can think of so that we know what Jesus is referring to. Okay, God creates Adam, right? He created Adam. He gives him dominion over the creation as a steward. He gives him a test, just like Jesus was tested in the wilderness. Adam fails that test. Adam rebels. Okay, so God establishes a kingdom of his own with himself as king by covenant, with the people of Israel after he rescues them out of Egypt. That's what happens on Mount Sinai, right? The Ten Commandments. Oh, but then Israel rebels. Okay, so God, through his prophets, foretell of a new kingdom that would redeem his people and have no end with a new covenant led by a specific anointed king known as the Messiah. That's what Messiah means. That's what Christ means. Christos in the Greek is Messiah. He's the king. There were specifics that would say what he was. There were specifics that said when he was coming. And Jesus matches all of them. Jesus shows up. He establishes his kingdom. He proves that he is the Christ and announces the good news and offer of peace to all of those who have rebelled, starting with the Jews. That's why this proclamation is so huge, guys. Jesus is saying, the king you heard was coming, the king, the Messiah that God promised through his prophets for hundreds of years, that king that will save Israel, no more waiting, no more searching. That king you've been waiting for for such a long time, that time is now. That time is fulfilled, and it's me. He turned the world upside down with this statement. And those aren't just my words, by the way. Take a look at Acts 17. I love this. Paul and Silas are in Thessalonica. They're preaching the gospel. We're specifically told that what they were preaching is that Jesus is the Christ, right? Jesus is the Messiah. He's the king. And they have to get out of town because an angry Jewish mob comes after them. They can't find them. They said when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them and they are acting against the decrees of Caesar saying that there is another king, Jesus. Now, you know what I love about this? It's that after 2,000 years, Jason is still family with those who are turning the world upside down. I can't get over that part. I love it. The gospel is about declaring Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the long-awaited king. That king is here, and that king is offering you a peace treaty. Promised and secured in blood. That offer of peace is what we call the gospel. It's the good news that peace is here. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like pretty good news to me. Pretty fantastic news, considering scripture says, I was an enemy of God, and he offers me peace. Now, I was a sinner, which is outright rebellion against a king, a traitor. Right? I deserve to be slaughtered for that. And instead, he offers me peace. That's amazing news, guys. What about the kingdom of God, right? You'll notice kingdom of God, Jesus refers to that in all sorts of places. 
What is the kingdom of God that he's referring to? Well, the most common mistake is for people to assume that the kingdom of God simply refers to heaven. It is not heaven. The reason that we make that mistake is that in the Gospel of Matthew, he routinely uses the word kingdom of heaven instead of the words kingdom of God because Matthew is Jewish and he's writing to a Jewish audience and culturally it's inappropriate to overuse the word God. So he replaces it with heaven. But if you check them side by side, you will see the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, they're interchangeable. They're the exact same thing and they're not heaven. Another common mistake is to think that the kingdom referred to here is a future plot of land, namely the land of Israel, as in like a country. Part of that stems from what we look at when we think of a kingdom today. We look at a map and we see something like the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And our only familiarity with a kingdom might be looking at that and saying, oh, that's a country, it's a plot of land. But if we took the people out of that kingdom, well, the leader there wouldn't be a king anymore. He'd just be a really wealthy landowner, right? Because by definition, a kingdom is a king and his subjects, right? A king and his loyal people. It doesn't have anything to do with land. You might know I work for a British company. I love my company. I love the people that I work for. Um, The British aren't just a people of wonderful manners and funny accents. Um, The British are subjects to a kingdom, the United Kingdom. They are subjects to the King of England. And that doesn't change for them if they move to America, move to Australia, uh, Asia, Africa. No matter what their physical address is, no matter what physical land they call home, they are still subjects of the kingdom. They're still subjects to the king of England. It's not dependent on land. A kingdom is dependent on a king and his people. That's a kingdom. Likewise, when we're talking about the kingdom of God, we are simply talking about God and his loyal people. It's a spiritual kingdom. We know that because Paul gives us a heads up in Romans 14, 17, that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God isn't based on anything physical. It's not based on anything ritual. It's based entirely on everything spiritual, namely, who has the Holy Spirit. It all boils down to this. If you have the Holy Spirit, you are in the kingdom. There's only one group of people who have the Holy Spirit. I'm sure you know who they are. They are the kingdom of God. God and his loyal people, the king and his loyal subjects, the bridegroom and his loyal bride, the olive tree and its loyal branches, the head and its loyal body, the father and his loyal children. You choose the metaphor. It all refers to the same thing. And today we call it the church. Not the church like this building that we're in, the church globally, as in All who are submitted to have given their lives over to the king, to Christ. It's a kingdom that knows no borders, no limits of space, no limits of time, no limits of growth. It grows every day. It's a kingdom that knows no limits of death even. It's the only kingdom in all of history that we can say is and will be everlasting. It has no end. It's the only kingdom that can never and will never be conquered. You enter that kingdom in faith today and you can enjoy every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You die in faith tomorrow and you will enjoy every spiritual blessing of his kingdom in the heavenly places forever. Death cannot keep you from or take you out of this kingdom. No one can. And Jesus says in his gospel proclamation that the kingdom of God is at hand. Like saying that it's come right here near you. In fact, some of your translations might phrase it that way. As though the gateway into this kingdom is right here in front of you. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because in John 10, he says, 
I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The kingdom of God has arrived and Jesus is the way into that kingdom. That is such good news, guys. That is the gospel of God. No mention of something else, though. Did you notice it? He doesn't say anything about heaven. He doesn't say anything about hell. We're, we're talking about the gospel, right? No, Jesus and his apostles, they didn't present a gospel based on heaven or hell. I mean, here's the challenge for you. Do a word search. You can do it with Google. Do a word search in all of the New Testament epistles and include the book of Acts, right? That's everything of the apostles that they preached, everything that they gave, at least that we have that still exists. And you'll find that the word hell is used exactly two times. Two times. James chapter 3 2 Peter chapter 2, neither of which is referring to the gospel. How's that possible? In all of Acts, all the preaching that we have recorded of the, God, of the apostles, never once. Paul, all of his teaching that we have, all the epistles, never once. Even with our most rock-solid evangelists today, you won't get five minutes into their gospel presentation without hearing one of those words or concepts, right? It's just a given, and yet, Jesus presented the gospel here in 19 words, and not one of them was heaven or hell. How is that possible? Well, you ever play Taboo? Yeah, I love Taboo. Taboo's a fun game. How does Taboo work? Taboo works by giving out these cards, and you are supposed to get your partner to say the word that's on top of this card, except you can't say any of the words that are on this card, right? It's a challenge. What if for fun, we just sort of made it a challenge that you were to do a gospel presentation and you were to play it this way, right? Or you were gonna convince your partner of the gospel, but you couldn't use either of these concepts. That would be pretty challenging, I think, for most Christians today. I mean. I don't know how many Christians would feel confident they could present the gospel at all. Consider it. You know what else might be scary about gospel taboo? It's the things that might already be taboo in our gospel presentations. I mean, there's some other words that it seems like we already don't use. Kingdom, king, lord, master, slave, servant, I don't hear those words used very often in gospel presentations. Jesus and his apostles use those words all the time. Look, I mention it not because heaven and hell aren't important concepts or because they aren't mentioned in scripture. Of course they are. I mention it only because Jesus and his apostles didn't make them the primary focus of their gospel message. Their primary focus, the gospel of God, was centered around moving people out of the kingdom of sin, out of the kingdom of Satan, out of the kingdom of Adam, and into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom of Christ, which is exactly what you see Jesus proclaiming here in our text today. Now, isn't it? <clears throat> Jesus preaches the proclamation of a kingdom, and Jesus preaches the kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the his king have arrived. Look, a gospel message that ultimately focuses on choosing heaven or hell is, I'm just going to say it, it's not false, but it's incomplete, right? And when people receive that kind of gospel message, all too often they can lead lives in Christ that are also incomplete, this is, this is so important. The gospel message is not a choice between heaven or hell. I mean, it's, maybe that sounds crazy, but the gospel choice is not a choice between heaven or hell. Those places are real. And yes, you will ultimately encounter one or the other. 
But the gospel message is not a choice between two places. Hear me say it. The gospel message is a choice between two masters. It's a, it's a choice between two kingdoms. Right? We, we weren't free before we came to Christ. No, the truth is that we were subject to another master. We were subject to an evil master. A master that sought not only to bring us harm, but death. That master was sin. Take a look at what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6. He says, for when you were slaves of sin, that means sin was your master. You were free in regard to righteousness, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Now, guys, the good news is that we're under an evil master and can actually choose a good one instead, right? We can choose a master who treats us like a good father treats his beloved children, who teaches them to be more like him instead of a master of murder, deceit, slander, gossip, immorality, hatred, who teaches his subjects to be more like him. We can choose a master who died for us rather than one who lives to see us die. We can choose a master who is life instead of a master who is death. Choose the right master. Choose the right Lord. And let's serve our Lord and serve him by proclaiming his good news of his kingdom's arrival as he did. But let's not forget what he also proclaimed about the kingdom, which was that we need to proclaim that the kingdom has conditions. There aren't any agreements made that aren't with, that are without requirements. Like that's just a fact of life. Right? In order to reside in any kingdom, you agree to the kingdom's conditions. And if you want to have life in God's kingdom, there are conditions as well. And Jesus says those conditions are repent and believe in the gospel. Right? Those two things in entering the kingdom of God are intrinsically linked. You don't have one without the other. But he splits them up here so we can dive into both here. Okay? Let's start with repenting. What is repenting? What's repentance? Well, the word, at least the root of the word for repentance is meta, which means change, noia, which means mind. Change your mind. That's what it is. It's a change in direction, a change of my way of living. Before, I was going my own direction. I was seeking my own desires and I was justifying my own version of the truth. But now I'm going God's directions, right? I'm seeking his desires. I'm knowing Jesus alone is the truth. It's going to mean that I recognize that my way of thinking, speaking, living has been wrong. Ah, can we say that? I mean, it would be hard to even get out of our mouths. Can we say that I was wrong to people? Can I admit that to people? Because guys, if we can't say that we were wrong, how can we ever open the door for unbelievers to see that the way they're viewing spiritual truth is also wrong? Our gospel message isn't you're out there and I'm in here. Our gospel message is I've been there. Come in here. Repentance is the universal connection point for all sinners because we all need to repent because we've all sinned. We've all needed a course correction in life and that continues to be the case as we sin down the road. The difference between believers and unbelievers isn't that believers never sin and unbelievers do. Right? The difference is in what we believe about sin. Because an unbeliever is driven to sin. Because they see sin as pleasure. They see sin as a source of happiness and comfort. And despite being clearly brief and clearly destructive, they're enslaved to it. We saw that in what Paul wrote. 
They have lost the ability to see sin for what it really is. And even in the midst of sin destroying their lives, they still want what they want. Believers, however, are driven from sin. Because we see sin as pain. We see sin as ultimately death. It separates us from a holy God. And we fall into temptation snare sometimes. It's true. But we've lost the ability to really enjoy it. Do you ever think about that? Like when I sin, I don't sit there afterwards and be like, man, that was a great idea. I'm glad I did that. Right? That doesn't happen. I hate myself when that hap- when I sin, right? I don't like what I've done. We want what God wants more. Repentance inherently means I will long for, I will ask for forgiveness from the one that I've wronged. So why is this a condition of the kingdom that's good news? Well, two reasons. One is that the king is merciful. He actually grants repentance in the first place. He doesn't have to, but he grants repentance. He forgives every single time we repent. That's merciful. And two, when Jesus calls me to repent, he's calling me into a right relationship with my creator. What do I mean by that? Well, you guys probably know I travel for work pretty much every week. I'm on a plane there we go. And uh, I'll sit down like these people are. And despite the fact that I don't know everything about the plane, I know it's a massive piece of machinery. It's incredibly powerful. But I'm really not too worried about it, just like they're not too worried about it. Right? Because as the plane's taking off, you could say, I'm in a right relationship with the plane. Right? I'm, des- I'm where I'm designed to be in the plane. So it makes sense to me, and I'm fine with it. There is no real concern. You wouldn't say the same thing for these people, right? These people are not in a right relationship with the plane, right? The plane is going to smoke these people. And this is spiritual truth when we are not in right relationship with God, when we're not in the right relationship with our king. Now, anybody that was in this relationship, you would figure they would automatically want to get on the plane and sit in the seat. The problem is that these people, spiritually speaking, right, they don't see their relationship with God like this. They see their relationship with God like this, right? Notice it's the same yeah, I'm not in the right relationship with God, but I've added deception on top of it, right? I have a false perception. I've been deceived into thinking that I'm king and God's my subject. This is a major problem to overcome. What solves this problem? The gospel solves this problem, right? You are giving them the truth to reset them back to what the actual situation is, which is this right? The gospel is the truth that Jesus says, I am king, you are not. Very basic. And when I get here, I'm driven to repentance. I don't want to be here when I see the truth and I see what is in front of me. Repentance is simple. I didn't say easy. Repenting is surrender. That's what repenting is. I mean, I love the story. The man who baptized me, Pastor Mark Barrett, he tells the story of him coming to Christ. He ran from God for years. He was angry with God for years. And the night he came to faith, he said to God literally two words, you win, right? That's how he came to faith. And everything changed after that. It's an incredible story. I love that because that's exactly what repenting is. You're no longer running from God. You're no longer running at God. Now you're running with God. Jesus also says to believe in the gospel. Right? Believing, trusting, faith is a condition 
of salvation. We say we're saved by grace through faith. We don't have saving grace without saving faith. But what's signaled here is something really special. Because when Jesus says believe, when he's asking for faith, he's asking for a relationship. See, because faith, trust is the foundation of a relationship. You can have a personal relationship without faith. So the king is saying he wants a relationship with us. He wants a relationship where we are completely dependent on him. You guys know Ray Comfort? Has anybody heard that name? He's a very popular evangelist and author. He's developed a, a gospel giving technique called the way of the master. Really, really interesting. Uh, I don't agree with every single thing he says, of course, but uh, he's super genuine. And I really enjoy watching videos of his where he approaches people on the street and converts them to Christ. And what he will say almost every time is that we need to trust in Jesus the same way that we trust in a parachute. And I love that image. I, I, that's fantastic. It's such a good illustration because an available parachute is really great news when you're on a crane, on, on a plane that's crashing, right? I don't want to overuse the, the plane imagery, but we're on a 747 of sin, people. I mean, this plane is doomed. And the king isn't simply handing you a parachute. No, Jesus is the parachute. Now, do you trust him? And Jesus is our only parachute in our daily lives, too. I mean, do we really trust Jesus that way? Do you and I trust Jesus that way with our spouse, with our families? Do you and I trust Jesus that way with our jobs, with our career paths? Do you and I trust Jesus that way with our finances? Do you and I trust Jesus that way with our ministries, with our service? Do you and I trust Jesus that way with our leisure? Oh, Jason, don't start talking about free time. Now. Do we trust him in all of those spaces? Because the truth, my friends, is this. The king is invading. Right? He's invading. He's come and he makes claim to all of it. Which leaves us with only two possible responses. Yes, it's all for you. You are my Lord. Or no, it's all for me. You are my enemy. There's no third option. It sounds overly simple. Maybe it sounds a bit harsh, but we're in the midst of a spiritual war, friends. And there are no spiritual Switzerlands in this battle. No matter how polished our rhetoric may sound, we are still ultimately either declaring submission to or declaring war on the King of Kings, folks. The good news of the kingdom of God leaves no middle ground. True faith is a condition of this king saving you. But let's be perfectly clear about what saving faith is. Faith is as much a character trait as it is a state of being. The root word here for believe, the root word in the Greek is pistis. That means faith, trust, belief, but it carries a dual nature to it, right? Where it also means faithful. It also means trustworthy. The faith that we're talking about here, it's faith in someone and it's faithfulness towards someone. Let's examine how this plays out. I mean, I mentioned earlier that the gospel, the good news that our king offers is a peace treaty, right? There's a specific name for the kind of treaty that it is. And that name is covenant. What's a covenant? Well, it's a contract. It's a promise. But it's a special kind of promise. It's a promise made before God and binding unto death. That's a covenant. Want a great example of a covenant we see today? How about marriage? Marriage is a covenant. I mean, did you ever think of Jesus saying, believe in the gospel as a marriage proposal from your king? That's exactly what it is. And the king is offering peace. He wants a relationship with you. He wants the closest and most personal relationship possible, in fact. He wants a covenant with you. He wants a marriage. The count 
right now is something like seven couples here at Mercy that are getting married like this year. I don't know, there's something in the water, right? And, uh, and Irina and I are blessed to be meeting with a few of those couples and exploring together what marriage is and what to prepare for, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it's not going to be any surprise to us at this stage in the game that the couples are going to sit like this far apart you know, they're going to gaze lovingly into each other's eyes and be super quick to compliment the other person and support their partner. I mean, one of them could have grabbed the other one's car and driven it into Lake Washington and their fiance would still be like, oh, that's just so adorable. <laughs> that's so you. Yeah. I just love the way you say that you love the way I say that I love you, you know? I mean, we're not expecting a lot of arguments at this stage in the game. And, that, and that's fine. That's great. We love to see them blessed. We love seeing the strong feelings they have for each other at this stage in the game. But just in case things don't always feel that way, sooner or later, the conversation has to come around to what it is exactly they're actually signing up for. They're signing up for a covenant. And that's important because... Too many marriages today begin with the idea of, of course, I'll always be here because I already know you'll always make me happy. That's not a marriage. That's a soap opera. You seen any marriage li marriages like that? You know any marriages like that? You wonder what went wrong when they end? No, marriage is not a well of happiness to draw from until the well runs dry, until we fall out of love. It's not, I will always be here as long as you always make me happy. Biblical marriage is, I will always be here, period. That's the end of the sentence. I promise I will always be here no matter how you make me feel. I promise I'll always be here no matter what the situation might be. I promise I'll always be here no matter why my friends, my family, my favorite author and talk show host might tell me it's okay to leave. I promise I will always be here and I will always be faithful to you. Marriage is a covenant. It's our most familiar covenant and yet we aren't always so familiar with what a covenant really means. What does covenant mean? The Hebrew word for covenant, berit, it literally means to cut. Why in the world would it mean that? To cut? Here's why. In ancient times, like Abrahamic times, well, they didn't have a bunch of paper to draw up contracts and treaties and agreements and stuff like that. No, all you had was the other party's word. So what they would do is they would take a sacrificial animal or sacrificial animals and cut them in half and put the halves of the animals on the ground and meet in between the two halves of the animals and state their promise, right? Saying, with God as my witness, I will uphold my promise to you until I die. And if I don't, this is what should happen to me. Yeah, I made you a little less likely to break your promise, right? With God as my witness, I promise that I will uphold my part of the bargain until I die or else I die, right? You're putting your own life on the line as collateral when you were making a covenant. Take a look at Jeremiah chapter 34. Whoa. <clears throat> it's a long chapter. I won't read it to you, but let me give you a synopsis where we are. It's the time of Zedekiah. Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He was not a good king. And the situation is that the Babylonian army has surrounded Jerusalem. Zedekiah gets a little desperate. So he makes a covenant with the Lord. He gets the officials of the city to come and make a covenant before the Lord that they will free the Hebrew slaves that they've had illegally in the city of Jerusalem. And they do. And things start to get a little bit better in Jerusalem. And as soon as they get better, Zedekiah and the city officials, they go round up those slaves and they enslave them again. 
They just promised that they wouldn't do it. God gets furious about this. And he says through Jeremiah, and the men who transgressed my covenant did not keep the terms of the covenant they made before me. I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and passed between its parts. Sound familiar? And what happened to those men? What happened to Zedekiah? Yeah, all those men were slaughtered when the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem. Zedekiah tried to escape, but Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, caught up to him, cut down his whole family in front of his eyes, and then gouged out his eyes so that that would be the last thing he ever saw, then hauled him away to a cold, dank prison in Babylon where he died. Does God take breaking covenants seriously? Does our king take breaking covenant promises seriously? You better believe he does. And if we enter into a covenant with him, if we enter into a covenant with a spouse, we'd better take it seriously too. Here's the good news. He never breaks a covenant promise. Never. He wants a relationship with you. The king wants peace with you. He's offering a new covenant ratified in his own blood, as in he himself was the lamb that was cut in half. And if holding that covenant is not, I know that I'll always be here because I already know that you'll always make me happy. Now, that's all too common to see in American Christianity today. And that's not a marriage. That's not a covenant relationship with your king. That's a soap opera. A real covenant relationship with our king instead says, Jesus, you are entirely faithful. I will be entirely faithful to you until I die or else I die. It's not only faith in him, but faithfulness to him. It's a relationship. Is that how we proclaim our king's conditions for life? Is that how we are living out our own? Look, to draw to a conclusion, guys, the gospel of God, what is it? Jesus preached that the time was fulfilled. The time was complete. And I believe his gospel message was no less complete. So what about ours? Are we careful not to make it a focus on our future, right? That it keeps me out of hell and it welcomes me into heaven. That's all true. That is good news but it's also incomplete. Jesus needs to mean more than a destination for our souls in the future. Jesus needs to be the destination for our souls today. He said his kingdom has conditions, but his kingdom is here. Our salvation has come. There cannot be better news than that, friends. The gospel is for unbelievers and believers alike. All of us need this good news. We all need salvation from sin and strengthening of relationship with our maker, our king. And he's here. The time is fulfilled. So then, are you? Are you fulfilled in him? Seek that salvation. Seek it and proclaim the salvation of the good king, the trustworthy king, the king of kings without waiting. And make that change for the better in your life starting today. The kingdom of God is at hand. Father, we are so thankful for this incredible, incredible gift. Your son, your gospel, our king. Lord, will you, will you help us take it to heart? Will you help us to go forth and proclaim this gospel in ways that absolutely glorify your great name and bring them to your kingdom? We ask in Christ's name. Amen.